Hey Spookaroos, I just wanted to pop in and give you the heads up that this episode has a couple technical glitches, a little electronic hiccups you'll hear. I did not hear them while I was recording, I only heard them after the fact while I was editing. We can blame Gremlins again, um, but I don't think that they ruin the show or anything. Though they can be rather jarring when they pop up out of nowhere, so you might want to avoid listening to this particular episode on headphones. Probably better for car or stereo use. But hey, it's your thing. Do what you want to do. Welcome to Spooky Ass Shit. I am your host, Eric Dwinnells, and I do apologize, Spookaroos. It's been a minute since I've given you a new episode, but I had some things come up last week, and I just uh, didn't have it in me to get an episode out. So here we are with this brand spanking new episode, and tonight... We are talking about UFOs, we are talking about possible government cover-ups, and we are talking about the birth of the modern UFO sighting and investigation, the very first reported, recorded usage of the term flying saucer, which happened to be on June 24th, which happens to be my birthday, not in the same year, of course, but tonight we are talking about the UFO encounter as told by Kenneth Arnold. The Kenneth Arnold case is one of the most infamous cases in American history, and I'm going to lay it all out for you tonight. But before we begin, of course, I want to remind you all to check out the show's website. That is SpookyAS.com or SpookyAssShit.com. Both of those things will take you to the same place, and that is the show's blog page. From there, you can listen to each and every episode including the ones no longer available on your favorite streaming service. You can also listen to uh, sometimes occasional outtakes and stuff like that. I haven't really posted that in a long time, but if you go back to the early, early episodes, there's a few of those kinds of things in there. You can also find links to all of our social media. We are at Spooky Ass Shit on Instagram, and you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash spooky as. Once you're there, you can also join our secret closed group, The Spookaroos. That way you can share all your thoughts and feelings about UFOs and Bigfoots and ghosts and vampires and such without the weight of public judgment upon you. It's a fun, hip, happening place. Also, once in a while, I do like little exclusive videos and a uh, little, like, not mini episodes, but, you know, little, little treats here and there. So, uh... You want to check that out. I think I might have even posted, I don't remember if this was on the main Facebook site or on the Spookaroos group, but there's kind of a lost episode that I did uh, with Tom Cole a long time ago. It was like the first version of Cults that we did. Uh, we did eventually kind of do another version of that episode. We, I think we ended up recording it three or four times, but the original version is on there somewhere with uh, some some technical glitches on it. But if you're interested, if you're a diehard fan and you just want to hear every last minute that I've recorded, then you got to go and you got to find that on the Facebook group, Spookaroos. All right. With all of that rigmarole out of the way, let's move on to tonight's story. Kenneth Albert Arnold was born on March 29, 1915. He founded the Great Western Fire Control Supply Company in Boise, Idaho, in 1940. The company sold and installed what they called fire suppression systems, what we would call sprinklers, sprinkler systems, to put out the fires in the big, you know, office buildings and factories and that kind of thing. That's what this guy was up to. His work took him to various locations throughout the northwestern United States, but happily, Arnold was also a very experienced, licensed pilot, and he could fly himself from location to location. He also had a little bit of a side hustle going. He used his aviation skills to his advantage in other ways. See, he often took part in search and rescue missions, especially those that offered a cash reward. It was while on one of these missions that Arnold had an experience that would change his life. Arnold was flying from Cahalas, Washington to Yakima, Washington in a plane called a Call Air A-2 on a business trip on June 24th, 1947. But 
when he heard that a $5,000 reward was being offered to anyone who could discover the crash site of a military transport plane that was believed to have crashed somewhere near Mount Rainier, Arnold decided to take a slight detour and see if he could find anything. The skies were completely clear and the wind was mild, so he figured it was worth a shot. Unfortunately, he was not able to find any trace of the downed aircraft. A few minutes before 3 p.m., at an altitude of about 9,200 feet, near Mineral, Washington, he gave up his search and started heading eastwards towards Yakima. He suddenly saw a bright flash of light, similar to sunlight reflecting from a mirror. Afraid he might be dangerously close to another aircraft, Arnold scanned the skies around him, but although he did see another plane out in front of him, it was many, many miles away, and he felt that there was nothing in his view that would have caused such a flash. About 30 seconds after seeing the first flash of light, Arnold saw a series of bright flashes in the distance off to his left, just north of Mount Rainier, which, at the time, was about 25 miles away from him. He thought that they might be reflections of his airplane's window, but after a quick test by rocking his plane from side to side and removing his eyeglasses, later rolling down his side window, he ruled out this possibility. When he looked again, he saw more clearly what had caused the flash. It was indeed the reflection of an aircraft flying near him, but there was not just one. There were many. Although he was an experienced pilot with well over 9,000 hours of flight time, Arnold could not identify these crafts. Yes, Arnold had an encounter with UFOs. They flew in a long chain, and Arnold thought they might be a new type of jet and started looking intently for a tail, but he was surprised when he couldn't find any. They quickly approached Rainier and then passed in front usually appearing in dark profile against the bright white snow covering Rainier, but occasionally still giving off bright flashes of light as they flipped around erratically. Sometimes, he said, they seemed to fly sideways, and they seemed so thin and flat that they were practically invisible. Reports from the time quote Arnold as describing the objects variously as saucers, discs, pie pans, or half-moons, or generally convex and thin. He likened their movement to saucers skipping across water, and although no actual news report quotes him as saying that they looked like flying saucers, this is the alien encounter, well, UFO encounter, where the term becomes popularized. Uh, and this is, you know, he talks about the saucers, and then they become flying saucers. But he always disputed that he ever called them flying saucers. Uh, there, there are pictures of him holding up uh, artist rendition of what these crafts were supposed to have looked like. And they look more like your traditional, you know, pie pan UFO. Except he said there was one that was kind of crescent shaped. It actually looks like something Batman might drive, like the Batwing or something like that. Only, uh, you know, backwards. And uh, kind of a crescent moon uh, with a with a red kind of I don't know if it's supposed to be like a control panel or a observation bay or something on the top. But you can find these pictures. I'll post them, of course, on the Instagram spooky at spooky as shit. At one point, Arnold said they flew behind the sub peak of Rainier and briefly disappeared. Knowing his position and the position of the unspecified sub peak. Arnold placed their distance as they flew past Rainier at about 23 miles away from him. Arnold originally estimated that the objects were about 40 feet in diameter, but he would later state that they were probably more like 100 feet. A truly accurate determination was difficult, he said, because the objects were approximately 23 miles from him, and it is hard to tell what you're looking at when it's 23 miles away. Arnold said that the objects grouped together in, quote, a diagonally stepped-down echelon formation, stretched over a distance that he would later calculate to be about five miles. Though they were moving on a more or less level 
horizontal plane, Arnold said that the objects weaved from side to side, darting through the valleys and around the smaller mountain peaks. They would occasionally flip or bank on their ledges in unison as they turned or maneuvered, causing almost blindingly bright flashes of light. The encounter gave him a, quote, eerie feeling, but Arnold suspected that he had seen the test flights of new U.S. military aircraft. As the objects passed Mount Rainier, Arnold turned his plane southward on a more or less parallel course. It was at this point that he opened his side window and began observing the objects unobstructed with any glass that might have produced reflections. The objects did not disappear, and they continued to move very rapidly southward, continuously moving forward on his position. Curious about their speed, he began to time their rate of passage. He said that they moved from Mount Rainier to Mount Adams, where they faded from view, a distance of about 50 miles, in 1 minute and 42 seconds, according to the clock on his instrument panel. That means that the UFO's speed was over 1,700 miles per hour, and that was about three times faster than any manned aircraft available at the time. Arnold landed in Yakima at about 4 p.m. and quickly told friend and airport general manager Al Baxter his amazing story. But Baxter was incredulous. He did, however, find Arnold's tale amusing enough to share it, and before long, the entire airport staff knew of Arnold's claims. Once word got around, Arnold was open to discussing his story with all the staff. He told a number of pilot friends, and although some laughed his tale off, one fellow pilot, a World War II veteran, shared that they had been briefed before going into combat that they might see objects of similar shape and design, and assured Arnold that he wasn't dreaming or going crazy. They were called Foo Fighters, and lots of military pilots had seen them in the skies over Europe. Arnold wrote in to share his story with the Air Force Intelligence. Instead of UFOs, they suggested that maybe he had seen guided missiles. But Arnold felt this couldn't be the case. He took his story to the press. Just one day after his encounter, Arnold went to the office of the newspaper, the East Oregonian, in Pendleton. The reporters he spoke with saw no reason to doubt Arnold's claims. He was, after all, a serious-minded businessman with very clear recollection and details to provide. Starting on June 26th or June 27th, Newspapers around the country, and yes, even the world, began using the term flying saucer or flying disks to describe the objects that Arnold had seen. Thus, the Arnold sighting is credited with giving rise to the popular term flying saucer. The story hit the papers, and Arnold very quickly seemed to regret sharing his story with the press. In a follow-up report just two days later, Arnold is quoted as saying, I haven't had a moment of peace since I first told the story. A preacher called to tell him that the objects he saw were, quote, harbingers of doomsday, and that the preacher was preparing his congregation for, quote, the end of the world. The same day, a woman in a Pendleton cafe noticed him and ran out of the door shouting, That's the man who saw the men from Mars! She then went on to state that she needed to do something for the children. Arnold continued, The whole thing has gotten out of hand. I want to talk to the FBI or someone. Half the people look at me as a combination of Einstein, Flash Gordon, and a screwball. I wonder what my wife back in Idaho thinks. Arnold's sighting was partly collaborated by a prospector named Fred Johnson on Mount Adams, who wrote to the Air Force that he saw six of the objects on June 24th at about the same time as Arnold, which he viewed through a small telescope. He said they were round and tapered, sharply to a point at the head of an oval shape. He also noted that the objects seemed to disturb his compass. An evaluation of witnesses by Air Force Intelligence found him to be credible. The Portland-based Oregon Journal reported on July 4th that they received a letter from L.G. Brenier of Richland, Washington. 
Brenier wrote that he saw three of the strange objects over Richland flying, quote, almost edgewise, towards Mount Rainier, at about half an hour before Arnold claimed his encounter took place. Brenier thought the three were part of a larger formation. He indicated that they were traveling at high speed. I have seen P-38s and other planes appear seemingly on the horizon and then go up the opposite horizon in no time at all. But these disks certainly were traveling faster than any P-38 or any other plane I've seen. Mr. Brenier was also the first to state outright that he believed it was possible these flying saucers did not have an earthly origin. Quote, I believe it may be a visitor from another planet. I don't know about you, Spookaroos, but I always get a little bit skeptical when a newspaper reports that they got a letter from a guy. And, you know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but anytime it's just a letter and there's no follow-up, then it seems a little suspicious to me, especially when it includes something salacious like this, like the idea that these objects might be from another planet. This sounds like something that could have been planted in the paper, written by one of their writers, and then, you know, thrown in as like, oh, we got a, we got a letter. We got a letter from this guy, and he says, maybe it's a UFO, and then they can put that on the front page or something and sell a few more papers with their aliens from outer space story. Just my two cents. Anyway, let us continue. When military intelligence began investigating Arnold's sightings in early July, they found yet another witness from the area, a member of the Washington State Forest Service who had been on fire watch at a tower in Diamond Gap, about 20 miles south of Yakima, reported seeing flashes at about 3 p.m. on June 24th over Mount Rainier. A Seattle newspaper also mentioned a woman near Tacoma who said that she had seen a chain of nine bright objects flying at high speed near Mount Rainier. Other Seattle newspapers also reported other sightings of flashing, rapidly moving unknown objects on the same day, but not at the same time as Arnold's sighting. Most of these sightings were seen over Seattle or the west of Seattle in the town of Bermerton, either that morning or that night. All told, there were at least 16 other reported UFO sightings on June 24th, 1947, the same day as Arnold's sighting in the Washington State area. However, a pilot of another plane that had been flying just about 10 to 15 miles ahead of Arnold en route to the Seattle airport reported that he had seen nothing unusual on June 24th. This is the pilot of the plane that Arnold himself acknowledged having seen in the skies with him. So obviously this is a very close witness who says he was up there, he didn't see nothing unusual. But the primary collaborative sighting, however, occurred 10 days later, on the 4th of July, when members of a United Airlines flight crew en route to Seattle also spotted five to nine disc-like objects that flew alongside their plane for about 10 to 15 minutes before suddenly zipping off and disappearing. On July 6th, speculation arose in newspaper articles that the objects being sighted were actually either a flying wing or a flying flapjack, which were sort of disc-shaped aircraft, both experimental planes under development by the U.S. military at the time. I looked up these planes. The flying wing um, looks very similar to a stealth bomber, if you're familiar with those. Um, and the flying flapjack is very bizarre looking. Uh, it doesn't look at all like a UFO. I can kind of see where you would, you know, see the flying wing, especially in 1947, and and be completely unfamiliar with that. But the flying flapjack looks like a plane, essentially. It just looks like a very weird plane. It's like a really short um, propeller plane. It's, um, you know, I don't know much about planes, but it's, you know, it looks like a plane. Uh, okay. But the U.S. military denied that either aircraft could account for the sightings. In fact, the U.S. military denied having any planes at all in the area of Mount Rainier at the time of this sighting. Perhaps not coincidentally, just days later, on July 8, 1947, an alleged UFO crash took place in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. 
This alleged crash would go on to be the most infamous UFO story in American history and lead to a never-ending series of conspiracy theories about what the U.S. government does or does not know about visitors from outer space. But Roswell is a subject for another show. The first military investigation into Arnold's claims came from Lieutenant Frank Brown and Captain William Davidson, who interviewed Arnold on July 12th. Arnold also submitted a written report at that time. Regarding the reliability of Arnold's sighting, they concluded, quote, It is the present opinion of this interviewer that Mr. Arnold actually saw what he stated he saw. It is difficult to believe that a man of his character and apparent integrity would state that he saw objects and write up a report to the extent that he did if he had not seen them. Despite this, the Air Force's formal public conclusion was that Arnold had seen a mirage. Now, of course, I know what a mirage is. Like, I grew up watching cartoons. I understand you're in the desert. You look off in the distance. You think you can see this oasis or something. And then you walk there and there's nothing. Or you just keep walking and it just keeps seeming further and further away. Well, mirages, I was actually unrelated to this, looking into what actually a mirage is. And I don't have all the scientific explanations, except that basically it's... Uh, it's heat bending light. Um, so, you know, on a really hot day when you look at the side, when you look down the street and it looks like squiggles, sometimes even off the roof of your car, it looks like squiggles. It's basically that happening to such a large extent uh, that the ground is hotter than the air above it. So uh, it's bending light rays. And sometimes this can cause you to see things that are miles and miles away. Um, and it looks like it's right in front of you. So that's why sometimes you can see the ocean in the desert or you can see trucks passing through the desert when there no there's no trucks there at all um you can you can see some of these on youtube it's a real thing that happens it's very interesting and uh kind of crazy that the world looks like that but mirages are definitely a real thing in addition on july 9th air force intelligence with the help from the fbi secretly began an investigation of what it considered to be the most credible ufo sightings mostly from pilots and military personnel. Arnold's sighting, as well as that of the United Airlines crew, were included on this list. Three weeks later, they came to the conclusion that the saucers reported were not imaginary or adequately explained by natural phenomena. Arnold and the other witnesses had seen something flying around them. This laid the groundwork for another intelligence report in September 1947 by General Nathan Twinning, who also concluded that the saucers were real and urged a formal investigation by multiple government agencies. This, in turn, resulted in the formation of Project Sign at the end of 1947, the first ever publicly acknowledged United States Air Force UFO investigation. Project Sign eventually evolved to become Project Grudge, and that ultimately became the more famous Project Blue Book. The personnel of the United States Marine Force, Project Sign, also studied Arnold's story. According to Major Edward Ruppelt, quote, I found that there were a lot of speculation on this report among Sign personnel. There were two factions, joined up behind two lines of reasoning. One side said that Arnold had seen plain, everyday jet airplanes flying in formation. The other side said they didn't buy this idea at all. There was an old theory that maybe Arnold had seen whipping snow along the mountain ridges, so I asked Air Force investigators about this, and I got a flat, impossible. Now many theories have been put forth to explain Arnold's sightings, and they include mirages, which we talked about. Uh, the most common one, as far as that goes, is that it was a mirage of the snow-capped mountain peaks nearby. Uh, others say it was just misidentified meteors. He saw some meteors passing, and he didn't quite understand what he was seeing. Others say they were just clouds of snow. Others think that they might have been spots of water on, the, on his airplane windows, Although, of course, like we said, he did roll down the window, so he claims, so that he could get a better look. 
and make sure that this kind of thing was not the case. It wasn't a reflection off his window or it wasn't, you know, moisture on his, his window. Uh, and he says he still saw the objects. So if that was the case, of course, he would not be able to see the objects. So it couldn't have been that if he's telling the truth. And then the best theory in my mind, and when I say best, I don't mean the one I think is most accurate. I mean the one that I want to believe the most because it's the funniest, is that he misidentified some pelicans. Yes, he mistook pelicans for over 100 feet long flying, flashing objects in the sky. And the people who believe this theory say, well, pelicans are pretty big and they kind of look crescent shaped when they fly. And they have a very white underside that can kind of sparkle when you see it. Um, I got to be honest with you people, maybe the mirage, but the rest of the ideas um, don't really cut it as far as I'm concerned, as far as an explanation. Um, I think a pilot would probably be able to recognize clouds. Uh, meteors do not behave in the way that Arnold described. And uh, I don't go for the pelicans or the waters on the windows. After his UFO sighting, Arnold became a minor celebrity. For about a decade thereafter, he was somewhat involved in interviewing other UFO witnesses or contactees. Notably, he investigated and reported on the claims of Samuel Eaton Thompson, one of the first American citizens to claim to have made actual contact with alien life forms. Arnold wrote a book and several magazine articles about his UFO sightings and his subsequent research. But by the 1960s, Arnold had tired of his notoriety and of UFOs in general, and he eventually declined all interviews. On June 24, 1977, however, he decided to attend the first International UFO Congress in Chicago to mark the 30th anniversary of his encounter and the birth of of the modern UFO age. Some of his comments at the event reflected his displeasure with the general ignorance concerning the topic. Quote, Mr. Arnold, Well, right here we've seen something. I've seen something. Hundreds of pilots have seen something in the skies. We have dutifully reported these things. And we have to have 15 million witnesses before anybody is going to look into this problem. Seriously? Well, this is utterly fantastic. This is more fantastic than flying saucers or people from Venus or anything else, as far as I'm concerned. Kenneth Arnold passed away in 1984 at the age of 68 from cancer. So that is the story of Kenneth Arnold and the flying saucers. Now, of course, that one always sticks with me because June 24th is my birthday. Of course, I was not born in 1947, but uh, still, fun fact nonetheless. It's John the Baptist Day, and it's also the first usage of flying saucers. Not the first reported UFO sighting in history by far, and definitely not even the first reported UFO sighting in American history, but interesting nonetheless. Um, as far as my feelings on this case, you know... As far as uh, the paranormal goes, aliens are something that I actually do believe in. Now, do I feel that they visit Earth? That is something that I uh, remain agnostic about, I would say. Uh, I am prepared to believe that it is possible. I have not seen ev any evidence myself that makes me believe it is probable. However... I do find this case more compelling than a lot of the cases we hear about. Um, it's not overly sensationalized, and there are multiple witnesses. Uh, although eyewitness testimony doesn't count for very much in the grand scheme of things, including Mr. Arnold's, I don't give that, you know, too. I don't want to say too much credit because I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying he's not credible, but I don't put all my faith in something because he says he saw it i'm willing to hear it out and uh if i had the ability to investigate i would but of course now we are so far removed from it you know it's whatever but uh definitely something that people should have been looking into and uh it's it's possible it is possible just i mean we look at 
the difficulties of space travel and we say, well, we would have to advance in technology to a ridiculous uh, amount to be able to get anywhere other than the moon, maybe Mars, maybe we can get to Mars, um, but we don't know how to bend space or time or space time uh, in, in order to travel and we, we can't handle the speeds that would be required to get from place to place. We would uh, vaporize or worse. And uh, so we just can't believe it. But who's to say that we're the oldest or smartest civilization out there? It's possible that beings on other planets are far more advanced than us and have discovered how to travel through dimensions that we have not even discovered yet. This might sound like crazy people talk, but it's really not. If you look into quantum physics um, and, and the parallel universes theories um, and string theory and all this kind of thing, like it's, it's happened time and time again that, you know, yesterday's science fiction is today's science fact. So it's possible that this could be true in the case of UFOs and aliens. I am not, however, prepared to believe everything that I hear just because some people said it happened. Um, and like I said, the more sensational reports, although I'm not saying that they absolutely aren't true, um, they are, I am a little bit more skeptical of those, something like the fire in the sky, Travis Walton reports, um, those kinds of things I find a little bit more difficult to believe in given the source, given the like career basically that he's made out of it. I don't mean to pick on him in particular, but Stories like that, people like that in general. Um, but yes, I think this Arnold case is very interesting. I did a little digging. I haven't found any dirt that makes me think Arnold had uh, some kind of ulterior motive. Although, of course, he did take speaking engagements and did write for magazines and wrote a book about it. But on the other hand, I mean, the cynical way to look at that is that he was in this for the money and this was a cash grab for him. But on the other hand, he was already... Uh, a businessman, although I don't know how successful his business was, but successful enough that he was able to fly his own plane around. Not so successful that he didn't have to fly his own plane around. Um, but uh, it just seems it's if the telling that we've been able to discover is to be believed, then it seems like he didn't have these motives ahead of time. And if something incredible happened to you, you probably would want to talk about it. If I saw a ghost in my room tonight, I would want to talk about it. And I wouldn't mind making a dollar off talking about it either. But so far, no ghosts or aliens or anything like that have appeared to me in my room or anywhere else. So we just have to keep our fingers crossed and keep on waiting. That brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you have enjoyed it. If you did, please, please, Feel moved right now by my words and my pleas and go to Apple Podcast or wherever you happen to listen from and leave a kindly worded review. I love to see your thoughts and feelings on the show. I'd love to hear about what kinds of episodes you enjoy the most. You can also, of course, reach out via email, spookyassshit at gmail.com. And you can always Facebook message or you can try Instagram messaging me, although I don't seem to always get those ones. Um, and yeah, join the Spookaroos. You can talk about stuff there. But please, sharing the show and writing those reviews, those are two of the most helpful things that you can do right now. And it really only takes a moment. And you're probably in quarantine since you don't live in Massachusetts, um, most of you and uh, things might not be going as well in your state as they seem to be here, seem to be. We did have a slight uptick yesterday, um, and we always got to be cautious about it. I believe that there will be another surge. My uh, day job is planning to open very shortly, uh, but I, we also have a plan for when we have to close again very quickly, which we believe will be likely, because I don't think Massachusetts luck is going to hold forever. And someone's going to throw a party or something. And, you know, this virus is going to break out again. But we're all trying. We, we got to do the best we can. Stay safe. Wear your goddamn masks. I don't care about freedom of whatever. What I'm telling you is when you go out in public, if you care about yourself, if you, more importantly, care about other people at all, and you should, don't be an asshole, you've got to wear your goddamn masks. We've got to save Halloween. Do you understand? Wear a mask now so you can wear a mask later. And until next time, 
keep an eye on the sky, and don't be afraid.